you know, you never get cured of autism. But what you do is you learn better, is you learn more and more things. Well, I didn't speak until I was four. Now I have a BA and a master's and I'm studying for my doctorate. I can remember the frustration of not being able to talk. I couldn't get my words out. My speech came in gradually, a few words at a time. When I was a little kid, I was very autistic, nonverbal, rocking, you know, that's the kind of kid they just put away in the institution. But I had a speech teacher that worked really hard with me, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of the young children getting early intervention. You got a two-year-old or three-year-old with no speech, don't wait. High school was absolutely worst part of my life. Teasing, teasing, teasing. I got kicked out of school for throwing a book at a girl. Teased me because, you know, teasing really made my life miserable. And the only places I could get away from teasing was the specialized activities. Things like horseback riding, electronics lab, model rocket club. The line was drawn in the sand. I was not allowed to become a recluse in my room. I had to get out and do things. I'm always kind of baffled at just how illogical people are in their thinking. I'm very logical in my thinking. But when I was younger, I didn't know that other people thought more in words. You see, I think in pictures. If I don't have a picture, I don't think. And my mind is very, very associative. Being a visual thinker, I have to, I tend to put things into categories. You see, autism is a very big spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you've got half the people at Silicon Valley. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got somebody who's very handicapped, remains nonverbal, is, is going to have to live in a supervised living situation. Really, really big spectrum. And, you know, Einstein probably be labeled autistic today in a lot of school systems because he had no speech until age three. I'm interested in seeing something that makes real change. I've done a lot of work that's made a lot of improvements in the livestock industry, and I think I've helped a lot of kids succeed. I want to see the kids that are like me succeed. That's the kind of stuff that makes me happy when I see the things that I do make a difference. One in 68 children will be diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. These days, one in 88 children will be diagnosed with autism. And the question is, why does this graph look this way? Has that number been increasing dramatically over time? Or is it because we have now started labeling individuals with autism, simply giving them the diagnosis when they were still present there before? A condition that involves significant impairments in social and communication skills. Mayo Clinic neuropsychologist Dr. Andrea Hebner says kids with autism. They have difficulty reading the social cues around them and then acting appropriately. They may isolate themselves or make repetitive movements. It's a developmental spectrum disorder. Autism is made up of a constellation of symptoms, including difficulty with communication, social interaction, and compulsive behaviors. They also have uh, what we call stereotypic behaviors. One of them might be spinning in place or hand flapping. Child psychiatrist Dr. Denise Duchik says symptoms can start in early childhood as young as two years old. Parents and pediatricians will recognize it early on, even before two years of age, uh, depending on how they're communicating and how they're interacting. Before 2013, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, the fourth edition, or the DSM 4, described autism as one of several pervasive developmental disorders, which also includes Asperger's syndrome, childhood disintegrative disorder, and those not otherwise specified, or PDD and OS. Asperger's syndrome was used for children that appeared to have characteristics of autism, like difficulties with social interactions or nonverbal communication but don't generally have significant delays in language or cognitive development, and therefore Asperger's syndrome was sometimes referred to as a high-functioning form of autism. Childhood disintegrative disorder was used to describe late onset of developmental delays, so these children develop normally for their age, but then they seem to lose the acquired social and communication skills sometime between age 2 and 10. Pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, is essentially a catch-all category in which patients meet some, but not all, features of autism, Asperger's syndrome, or childhood disintegrative disorder. 
Researchers found, however, that separate diagnosis of these pervasive developmental disorders weren't consistent across different clinics, since they tend to have very similar signs and symptoms. As of 2013, the DSM-5, a new revised edition, removed these terms and replaced them with Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, which encompasses all of the previous pervasive developmental disorders, but uses a scale, or a spectrum, that differentiates based on the severity of two major areas, social communication and interaction deficits, and restrictive or repetitive behavior, interests, and activities. Do you guys mind if I start? Um, Penny, yeah. that's where I sit. <laughs> No, I sit there. What's the difference? What's the difference? Here we go. In the winter, that seat is close enough to the radiator to remain warm, and yet not so close as to cause perspiration. In the summer, it's directly in the path of a cross breeze created by opening windows there. And there, it faces the television at an angle that is neither direct, thus discouraging conversation, nor so far wide as to create a parallax distortion. I could go on, but I think I've made my point. In the social and communication area, there are four subcategories that clinicians look for deficits. The first is social reciprocity, which refers to how children respond or reciprocate in social interactions. So like how the behavior of one person influences the other, and vice versa. An example impairment in this area might be referring to being alone and not taking a role in social games. A second area of potential deficit is joint attention which is the state of wanting to share an interest with someone else. So it's like, hey, check out this awesome thing I found. So an example impairment in this area might be a child not sharing their interests or amusement in an object with their parent. Next, there's nonverbal communication, which refers to difficulties either using nonverbal communication themselves or interpreting nonverbal cues from someone else. So maybe the child won't put their arms out when they want to be picked up. Or maybe they won't be able to tell when a parent's upset, even if the parent's frowning and crossing their arms. The last subcategory of communication deficits is in social relationships. So children have trouble developing and maintaining relationships. So maybe the child has a hard time making friends, or they're able to make friends, but their behavior tends to drive the friends away. The other major area is called restrictive and repetitive behaviors. And this category is pretty broad and can include a whole bunch of behaviors some being more well-known or characterized than others, like lining up toys in a ritualistic sort of way, or flapping one's hands, or imitating words or phrases. The child might be fixed on certain routines, like taking the same route every day to school, or they might have restricted patterns of interest, like having a very specific and in-depth knowledge of the Titanic, or vacuum cleaners. Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder might exhibit one or more of these deficits, and vary in how severe the deficit is. With that in mind, it's important to remember that each child with Autism Spectrum Disorder is going to have a different spectrum of symptoms and deficits. Some cases are mild, others more severe. But autism is not a single condition. It's actually a spectrum of disorders. A spectrum that ranges, for instance, from Justin, a 13-year-old boy who's not verbal, who can't speak, who communicates by using an iPad to touch pictures to communicate his thoughts and his concerns, a little boy who, when he gets upset, will start rocking, and eventually, when he's disturbed enough, will bang his head to the point that he can actually cut it open and require stitches. That same diagnosis of autism, though, also applies to Gabriel another 13-year-old boy who has quite a different set of challenges. He's actually quite remarkably gifted in mathematics. He can multiply three numbers by three numbers in his head with ease. Yet when it comes to trying to have a conversation, he has great difficulty. He doesn't make eye contact. He has difficulty starting a conversation, feels awkward. And when he gets nervous, he actually shuts down. Yet both of these boys have the same diagnosis of Autism Spectrum Disorder. The next question everyone wonders is, what caused autism? And a common misconception is that vaccines cause autism. But let me be very clear. Vaccines do not cause autism. <laughs> 
In fact, the original research study that suggested that was the case was completely fraudulent. It was actually retracted from the journal Lancet in which it was published, and that author, a physician, had his medical license taken away from him. <laughs> the Institutes of Medicine, the Centers for Disease Control, have repeatedly investigated this, and there is no credible evidence that vaccines cause autism. So the question remains: What does cause autism? In fact, there's probably not one single answer. Just as autism is a spectrum, there's a spectrum of etiologies, a spectrum of causes. Based on epidemiological data, we know that one of the causes, or one of the associations, I should say, is advanced paternal age. That is, increasing age of the father at the time of conception. In addition, another vulnerable and critical period in terms of development is when the mother's pregnant. During that period, while the fetal brain is developing, we know that exposure to certain agents can actually increase the risk of autism. In particular, there's a medication, valproic acid, which mothers with epilepsy sometimes take. We know can increase that risk of autism. In addition, there can be some infectious agents that can also cause autism. How are we going to intervene? It's probably going to be a combination of factors. In part, in some individuals, we're going to try and use medications. And so, in fact, identifying the genes for autism is important for us to identify drug targets, to identify things that we might be able to impact, and can be certain that that's really what we need to do in autism. But that's not going to be the only answer. Beyond just drugs, we're going to use educational strategies. Individuals with autism. Some of them are wired a little bit differently. They learn in a different way. They absorb their surroundings in a different way, and we need to be able to educate them in a way that serves them best. Beyond that, there are a lot of individuals in this room who have great ideas in terms of new technologies we can use. Everything from devices we can use to train the brain to be able to make it more efficient and to compensate for areas in which it has a little bit of trouble. To even things like Google Glass, you could imagine, for instance, Gabriel with his social awkwardness might be able to wear Google Glass with an earpiece in his ear and have a coach be able to help him, be able to help think about conversations, conversation starters, being able to even perhaps one day invite a girl out on a date. All of these tech, new technologies just offer tremendous opportunities for us to be able to impact the individuals with autism. The origins of ABA therapy harken back to the research of a groundbreaking psychologist by the name of B. F. Skinner. Dr. Skinner believed that behavior is changeable through positive reinforcement. Skinner found through his research that we all learn through the consequences of behavior. Behavior that is reinforced tends to rewire us and becomes our default behavior. He also found that behavior that is not reinforced. Will dissipate over time. Skinner's research is commonly seen in every one of our lives. As children, we learn to walk, talk, and avoid picking up hot things through repetitive training from our parents or loved ones. We learn most of our basic life skills through repetitive reinforcement. Reinforcers are essentially the outcomes of the rewards or consequences from our own behaviors. For example, rewarding a child for cleaning his room with money is a positive reinforcer. Cheering a child as she takes her first steps conveys to the child that the awkwardness of her first steps is worth the risk. ABA therapy simply expands this training in intensive ways until each child struggling with autism reaches new milestones and develops the habits he will need to live a full life as an adult. ABA therapy is、uh, changing behavior by looking at what is、uh, reinforcing the behavior. So things that happen after a behavior occurs, where you can either expect that behavior to continue or expect that behavior to stop. And we look at the principles of learning in how we can change that behavior. So can we set up specific environmental situations? We call those antecedents. 
to ascertain a specific behavior. And then if the behavior happens that we want, how do we reinforce it so that we can expect that behavior to occur again in the future? They have the way to help kids with autism down to a fine science that has little tiny goals that get added together to take a child from not being able to interact with other kids, being focused on their own internal world into kids that can tolerate other kids, can be at school, can follow circle time, can answer questions for you, can get their needs met, can communicate. And that doesn't come from broad sweeping goals. It comes from this daily battle <laughs> with these kids with tiny little goals. Let's say um, we were trying to teach a child colors and uh, we've got some different objects out for them and we're trying to teach them which one is the red object and they just keep picking the yellow one over and over. So there's different principles of behavior, there's different learning strategies that we may use uh, where we elicit the behavior that we're looking for, we elicit the response that we're looking for. So we may move the red apple a little bit closer to them. Uh, that would be one type of prompt that we could use. And then when they pick the red apple, that's the red object that we were looking for, then we would give them some kind of reinforcer. It could be praise, it could be a high five, it could be something that they like, um, an edible item, it could be a toy for them to play with, something to let them know that the behavior that they just had or the, the response that they just gave us is what we were looking for and that's a good thing. And then we would expect, uh, based on that principle of reinforcement, that the next time that we ask them the same question, which is the red object, that they would be able to give us uh, the correct answer. Um, so they're going to first you know, be able to point to a choice between two objects and they're going to be able to point between two pictures of what they desire. Then they're going to be able to say one of the words and they're going to be able to request one of the words. And that process takes weeks to develop, but if they can slowly work at it, they'll get the child there. So at home, parents can be frustrated for years that they can't understand what their kid wants, they can't communicate with their child, and they don't have the time and the expertise to know what are the little steps that their kid needs to make to get there. ABA therapists know that and have the time because it is one-on-one -on -one therapy at such an intense level. They get the child to where they need to be, which seemed impossible before ABA existed. My name is Alice, and I want to tell you about how I learn. I go to mainstream school. This is where I learn. It has structure with clear areas where my learning takes place. I like boundaries. There are different parts of the floor where different learning takes place. When I know what my teachers want me to do, I go to my workstation, where I can work in my own structured way. With my tasks to do on the left, my workspace in the middle and my finished work on the right. My teachers help me with my work schedule too. So I know what's going to happen now, next and then. My teacher introduces the schedule, sometimes reminds me to use it to make sure the tasks are done. My teacher has to remind me less and less. I like it when the tasks are laid left to right and I know that there is a finish. I start 
with what my teacher calls a posting exercise. After this, we'll make it harder by doing a two-part posting exercise. We also work on matching activities, fine motor skills and lots more. Once the work is finished, we put it in the finished box. I learnt the idea of finished by using my finished box. When I am done, I get my reward. My teachers show me my visual timetable. We work together so I can focus on what we're doing. And I can get my reward later. This helps me become independent so I can do my timetable on my own. If I get lost, my teacher uses a check your timetable card. I haven't told many people this, but in my head, I've got thousands of secret worlds all going on all at the same time. I'm also autistic. People tend to diagnose autism with really specific checkbox descriptions, but in reality, there's a whole variation as to what we're like. For instance, my little brother, he's very severely autistic. He's nonverbal. He can't talk at all, but I love to talk. Um, people often associate autism with liking maths and science and nothing else, but I know so many autistic people who love being creative. But that is a stereotype, as the stereotypes of things are often, if not always, wrong. For instance, a lot of people who think autism and think Rain Man immediately. That's the common belief that every single autistic person is Dustin Hoffman, and that's not true. But that's not just with autistic people either. I've seen it with LGBTQ people, with women, with POC people. People are so afraid of variety that they try and fit everything into a tiny little box with really specific labels. Like, this is something that actually happened to me in real life. I googled autistic people are, and you know, it like comes up with suggestions as to what you're going to type. I googled autistic people are, and the top result was demons. That is the first thing that people think when they think autism. They know. Um, <laughs> one of the things I can do because I'm autistic, it's an ability rather than a disability, is I've got a very, very vivid imagination. Like, let me explain it to you a bit. It's like I'm walking in two worlds most of the time. There's the real world, the world that we all share, and there's the world in my mind, and the world in my mind is often so much more real than the real world. Like, it's very easy for me to let my mind loose because I don't try and fit myself into a tiny little box. That's one of the best things about being autistic. You don't have the urge to do that. You find what you want to do, you find a way to do it, and you get on with it. If I was trying to fit myself into a box, I wouldn't have been here. I wouldn't have achieved half the things that I have now. There are problems, though. There are problems with being autistic. And there are problems with having too much imagination. Like, school can be a problem in general, but having also to explain to a teacher on a daily basis that their lesson is inexplicably dull and you are <laughs> secretly taking refuge in a world inside your head in which you are not in that lesson, uh, that adds to your list of problems. Um, <laughs> Also, when my imagination takes hold, my body takes on a life of its own. When something very exciting happens in my inner world, I've just got to run, or I've got to rock backwards and forwards, or sometimes scream. Like, like, this gives me so much energy, and I've got to have an outlet for all that energy. But I've done that ever since I was a child, ever since I was a tiny little girl. 
and my parents thought it was cute, so they didn't bring it up. But when I got into school, they didn't really agree that it was cute. It can be that people don't want to be friends with the girl that starts screaming in an algebra lesson. And this doesn't normally happen in this day and age, um, but it can be that people don't want to be friends with the autistic girl. It can be that people don't want to associate with anyone who were or can't fit themselves into a box that's labelled normal. But that's fine with me, because um, it sorts the wheat from the chaff, and I can find which people are genuine and true, and I can pick these people as my friends. But if you think about it, what is normal? What, what does it mean? Imagine if that was the best compliment you ever received. Wow, you are really normal. <laughs> that compliments are, uh, you are extraordinary, or you step outside the box, it's, you're amazing. So if people want to be these things, why are so many people striving to be normal? Why are people pouring their brilliant individual light into a mode? People are so afraid of variety that they try and force everyone, even if people who don't want to or can't, to become normal. There are camps for LGBTQ people or autistic people to try and make them this normal. And that's terrifying that people would do that in this day and age. All in all, I want to trade my autism and my imagination for the world. Because I am autistic, I've presented documentaries for the BBC, I'm in the midst of writing a book, I'm doing this, this is fantastic. And one of the best things that I've achieved, that I consider to have achieved, is I've found ways of communicating with my little brother and sister, who, as I've said, are non-verbal, they can't speak. And people would often write off someone who's non-verbal, but that's silly because my little brother and sister are the best siblings that you could ever hope for. They're just the best and I love them so much and I care about them more than anything else. I'm going to leave you with one question. If we can't get inside the person's mind, no matter if they're autistic or not, instead of punishing anything that strives from normal, why not celebrate uniqueness and cheer every time someone unleashes their imagination? Thank you.